Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning, Candy. You know, as I was driving in today, I was thinking about the recent time change Mm -hmm. because you and I had a brief text conversation this morning about it. That was one of the reasons why it was on my mind. Mm -hmm. I personally was driving in thinking about how pretty it is. It's such a beautiful day. And I, Kirk and I both spoke about the fact that last night it stayed light later and it it made me feel springy. I I love love that. But you've had an experience that's not quite as as great. Is that Springy, you want me to tell everybody what happened to me this morning? (laughs) So my cats have a pattern and my cat Henry is not feeling well and he has been having a pattern of waking me up around 3 a.m. just with a little like, ow, I don't feel good. (laughs) So, you know, I have that, I guess, pet mother, like I'm wide awake. And so I'll be awake for several hours and I'll go and take a nap later. Well, he woke me up today, but it was four o'clock because he thought it was because of the time change. Yeah, he thought it was three (laughs) o'clock, but it was actually four o'clock. So that that was my morning, but I'm going to power through. I had a tiny nap. Because you were awake then for a long time. Oh yeah, about four hours, four Uh. or five hours. Yeah, but then you said you had a tiny nap. Tiny nap. And here we are, ready to go. I'm ready to do this. Well, the other reason I was thinking about the time change and the sunshine was the fact that we are heading into a new month. Mm -hmm. And I personally think this is going to be such a strong month. Mm -hmm. This is going to be, I think, powerful, very moving. But I think the sunshine is good because we need to be prepared for the fact Mm -hmm. that it's going to be a little dark and a little sad. It is. Yeah, our theme this month is gone too soon. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be talking about some beloved, notable people who had their lives tragically cut short too soon, too early. I think it could be relative because I was thinking we've got people of all ages and people that are very young, people that are a little bit older. And you may say, well, gone too soon should be this age. I think if you love them, it's always going to be too soon. I agree. I don't think it's about age, Mm -hmm. but I think it's also about whether or not you kind of had a chance to finish things out the Mm -hmm. way you wanted to. The way you wanted to, yeah. Right. And and I think in all of the instances that we're going to discuss... That was not the case. Right. That, you know, these were unexpected, People tragic had circumstances. Plans. Yeah, Lots they, of plans. Right. Yeah. And we are starting today, guys, with, oh my goodness. I mean, I don't even know... <sighs> I don't even know how to talk about this young girl. She is so significant worldwide. Mm -hmm. She's significant historically. She is significant from a literary aspect. She is significant for the person she was. Mm -hmm. Just this beautiful, vulnerable, smart, witty young girl that Mm -hmm. we got to watch through books and and other forms of uh, media grow, you know, as she was living through the most, oh gosh, horrible and, and extraordinary circumstances. I would say she's probably the one person this month that almost everyone would know. Right. You know? Right. Or yeah. have familiarity have heard of. with. Right. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. We are, of course, talking about Anne Frank. And so before we get into talking about more of the details of her life, I wanted to start with the simple question, which I think I know the answer to. Mm-hmm. Have you ever kept a diary? I have. I figured. Yes. I so did. I was thinking, what's the difference? Because I know I think I also know the answer to this. We've both journaled. Mm-hmm. I've mentioned that I keep a gratitude journal. Over the years, I've mm-hmm. kept a writing journal. Mm-hmm. I've also kept a diary. What's the difference between journaling and mm-hmm. writing in a diary? Gosh, that's a really good question. I feel like a diary is something that you hope no one else ever reads. Mm -hmm. And journaling, it's almost like you're writing your own little devotional book of here's how I made it through the day, or here's what I'm thinking about, or words of wisdom, things like that, where a diary would be like, here's what happened to me today. Here's why it stank. Here's how I feel. (laughs) This person's terrible or whatever, you know, just the real feelings of yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's a different. I was tra- like- I, well, I was thinking about it, and and I I think you've hit upon it. I think it's the purpose, right? Mm-hmm. 
when I kept a writing journal, I had an eye towards, even though they were my own little seed ideas and I wasn't, you know, intending to go show it to somebody right Mm -hmm. then, I had an eye toward publication Mm -hmm, possibly. mm -hmm, When mm -hmm. I keep a gratitude journal, I'm very focused on the purpose of thinking about things I'm grateful for. When I kept my diary, it was, as you said, very personal. It was Mm self-reflection. I didn't want anybody else to see it. Mm -hmm. I can remember, I think I wasn't even, I don't even think I was 10. I think I had my first diary when I was maybe nine years old and I I was super excited because it had a little lock lock and key. key. That was like, the best thing to a nine-year-old and I would write things like you know my thoughts and feelings about getting into a fight with one of my sisters or Mm -hmm. I had a crush on this particular boy and Mm -hmm. I did not want anybody Mm -hmm. to read anything (laughs) I remember one time Janie I think it was took my diary when I'd been writing in it and I'd left it open and Mm -hmm. I about tore the house down trying to tear that thing back out of her hands because Mm -hmm. I did not want her to read anything well that's also I mean it's not in this it's not the same thing but in Little Women when when her story gets burned Mm. just the fact that words are destroyed or seen by somebody else before someone's ready for it that's why I was like oh no no forgiveness I would never ever 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 forgive her for that you know absolutely absolutely and that brings me to the next question I actually have have taught this book. This is why this is such, oh gosh, I don't even know. This is going to be such a meaningful episode to me, getting to honor Anne Frank, getting to talk about these characters. Because when I first started my career in education, I taught this book several times. And I feel like, I feel like I know, you know, I know these people. Mm -hmm. I know Anne. Yes, I'm so attached to them. And I will say though, I'm just going to follow that out. I cannot believe as I was researching this, I was so surprised to come across new information. Things. Really? Yes. I, there's, this was fascinating fascinating to me. There were so many things I came across that were either new to me or made me think about things that I'd never thought about before relative to the story. I mean, oh my goodness. So I'm so excited about this. But back to my point, I always asked my students, think about if you've ever kept a diary or written something very personal to you, how would you feel about somebody other than you reading it, having the power to take it and put it out for the world to see, deciding deciding what's going to be published, that Uh it's going to be published, first of all, to begin with, but then what's going to remain in it? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. like, what is the content going to be? I mean, just the thought of that. I know, as a little kid, I had to, I did start diaries, but I had to quit because I wasn't telling the truth, because I kept thinking (laughs) that someone was going to read it. So I was writing my own edited version of my own history, and I was like, what's the point of this? Because I'm not being truthful about how I really feel, because I didn't want people to know that I was mad about something, or or whatever. You couldn't even be real with your diary. I couldn't even be real with myself and that probably is something real psychological we could hop in an armchair later but I'm trying to get better about being more authentic in the journals that I'm doing now Mm -hmm. because you know who's it gonna help if I'm not telling the truth such a good point yeah well I think we've brought out already even in just talking for two or three minutes how important it was that Anne was a writer Mm -hmm. and that she was willing to be Mm -hmm. authentic. Mm -hmm. She was her real self. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure as we are talking about her story and sharing the different things that happened throughout this, that we continue to hear Anne's voice. Yes. So every now and then I'm going to bring out one of her quotes and I'm going to start with one right now. Here's something that she said, quote, I want to go on living even after my death. And therefore, I am grateful to God for this gift, this possibility of developing myself and of writing, of expressing all that is in me. I can shake off everything if I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. But, and that is the great question, will I ever be able to write anything great? Will I ever become a journalist or a writer? Oh, I know. So well spoken. Oh my goodness. Oh, so smart. Yes, so articulate in everything that that she wrote, that she said. But I also thought, talk about tragic. Mm -hmm. That was her dream. That was Mm -hmm. her wondering. And she did. She achieved it. But Mm -hmm. it was so tragically, Mm -hmm. it was after her death. Her book has gone on to far exceed any of her hopes for success as she was writing those words in her diary like 80 years ago. According to an article that was called Nonfiction Book Sales Statistics, it was published a year ago on the Words Rated website. They said that the diary of a young girl ranks in the top 10 best-selling nonfiction books of all time. Numerous sources agree that the book sales are around 35 million. Wow. And that though it was originally, of course, written in Dutch, the book has now been translated into more than 70 different languages. Probably we're all aware that there's at least one very well-known play Mm -hmm. version that's been made from the book. We'll, We'll come back to that later. And although I did not you know, do a deep dive on this. I just did a quick search on IMDb and I found where someone had created a list of 
30 different movies, miniseries, and documentaries. 30. 30. Wow. All related to Anne's story. I'm sure that's not a comprehensive list. I'm sure there are many more. Right. So all of this from this, this girl's girl. work. Mm -hmm. Yes. I found yesterday, just by happenstance, there was a, on the back of an envelope, when mm -hmm. we've created our theater, because you always write important things on the back of an mm -hmm. envelope, right? <laughs> we created a list of if... It was just a few of us sitting around a table, like, what would we want to put on? And every few years, I go back and revisit that to see if we've done any of the things on there. And Diary of Anne Frank was is one of on them. that list. Yeah. yeah. I actually auditioned for it one time. You did. I wanted so desperately to be cast. But this Aww. is, those of you who are actors, you're going to relate to this. Every different theater has a different process for their auditions. And this is one of the few times when they really, really, they were very upfront about it. They were very focused in on appearance. They uh, wanted the families to look like family that members so even after we had done the audition process they had us stand in mm -hmm. groups and took photos of us mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. with the people the mm -hmm. different arrangements of families I don't think I looked like the mom oh, <laughs> I'm sorry I, don't, I, don't, I think I just didn't look the part didn't make the and I was disappointed because I really would have liked to have been in this play well maybe we'll do it one day you can try out for right. us yes well again you've already said it I think so many people know this work and and have a, a full yes. understanding of the story but we're going to read the summary of the book nonetheless this is what the publisher puts out on their site Ashley would you want to read this for us? sure and Scotty has joined me if you did not already hear him everyone discovered in the attic in which she spent the last years of her life Anne Frank's remarkable diary has since become a world classic a powerful reminder of the horrors of war and an eloquent testament to the human spirit in 1942, with the Nazis occupying Holland, a 13-year-old Jewish girl and her family fled their home in Amsterdam and went into hiding. For the next two years, until their whereabouts were betrayed to the Gestapo, they and another family lived cloistered in the secret annex of an old office building. Cut off from the outside world, they faced hunger, boredom, the constant cruelties of living in confined quarters, and the ever-present threat of discovery and death. In her diary, Anne Frank recorded vivid impressions of her experiences during this period. By turns thoughtful, moving, and amusing, her account offers a fascinating commentary on human courage and frailty, and a compelling self-portrait of a sensitive and spirited young woman whose promise was tragically cut short. I think that summed it up pretty well. It does. Yeah, yeah, I remember I remember reading it in either elementary or middle school myself. It's been something, from my experience, the Holocaust is something that obviously is always talked about in social studies classes. Mm -hmm. But as far, as long as I've been aware of it, it's also been part of the English curriculum at the eighth grade level. Okay, maybe it, that's when I did read it then, mm -hmm. eighth grade. Yeah. Something I want to mention before I go on and we start talking about the whole backstory of, of how Anne's diary came to be written... I I, oh my goodness, so many wonderful interviews and clips and excerpts and articles. And so, I mean, so many different sources were out there that were just amazing. But one of the best that I have to give a shout out to is the Anne Frank House website. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how much time I spent on that. Yeah. It was just just amazing. So I would recommend you go check that out yourself mm -hmm. if you haven't already. If I ever make it over there, I'm going to visit. I, I just have to go. My sister Sherry actually got to go. She got into, to go? Yes, she got to go. It's been a long time ago, but I asked her what she remembered. And she said a couple of the key impressions that she took away was how very small it yes. was. And the thought of these people who had to live in such a tiny space for over two years. Like that just, you know, just walking through it and mm -hmm. thinking about that that really struck her and then she said the other thing was the reverence of the people walking through she said they waited in line there was she said there was a huge line and you kind of because it was so small mm -hmm. you had to kind of like trail almost single file as you right. were walking through and she said as they started to go through absolute silence wow wow yeah. but that said let's go ahead and talk about the backstory so Anne was born actually in Germany on June 12th of 1929 her parents were Otto and Edith Frank and she had an older sister Margot who was three years older as they were living in Germany of course the Nazi regime came to power mm -hmm. 
and they started experiencing these anti-Semitic attacks that were happening. And by the way, Otto and Edith, they were on it. These were people who, who saw were, it coming. They did. And I think I think Otto was very instrumental in this. He decided we're moving. We are getting out of here. He saw that this was not going in a good direction. So in 1933, they moved to the Netherlands for safety and it seemed like they were doing okay. Otto actually ran two companies. He was very, very astute. He knew how to run things. He knew how to start companies. He was really good. One of those was Opecta, which manufactured products used for making jellies and jams. So he started running this Opecta factory in the Netherlands and his daughter started living their life, going to Dutch schools, just, you know, this is now their new home. Mm -hmm. But as the Nazi aggression increased, of course, they, they then moved took in. A, yep, they moved in. They took over and now they're feeling it here. So Otto attempted so many different things. He started making an effort to open a factory in Great Britain with the idea that maybe his family could move to Great Britain. That fell through. Mm. In 1938, he added his family's names to a waiting list for American immigration visas. Waited two years, mm. still had not gotten an interview for that visa. And then there was a bombing by a Nazi aircraft that destroyed the U.S. consulate building, destroyed the list. And oh. for some reason, they didn't get back on the list. And maybe they didn't realize they were off they, of it. that they were off of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in 1941, Otto wrote to his old friend, Nathan Strauss Jr. His friends called him Charlie. He was the son of the founder of the Macy's Levi's Department Strauss? Store. Oh, Macy's Department. Okay. Yeah. And so Otto was asking Charlie for help. This guy not only had money because he was in the Macy's family, but he also worked for President Franklin Roosevelt's administration. Oh. So he had political connections and he was 100% on board to help them. So he's working to try to get them to the U.S. Edith's two brothers had already immigrated to Boston themselves. They didn't have the funds, but they were trying logistically to help with paperwork. So all these people are trying to get them to the U.S. Charlie actually had signed five copies of an affidavit in June of 1941 for the Frank family saying that he would sponsor their immigration and then the U.S. consulate in Rotterdam was closed down and they lost their hopes of going Gosh. to the U.S. and they started trying to work on going to Cuba and then that fell through. So they were doing everything. These people were trapped. Yeah. And so in the meantime, Otto started talking to his co-workers. Remember, he's running this business. Mm -hmm. He has trusted Dutch co-workers who are working in the office with him, helping to run this, this company. And he asks, would you guys be willing to help us hide? And that's a big ask. That is a huge ask because they were risking their lives mm -hmm. to help him. Mm -hmm. And they agreed. Mm -hmm. They absolutely readily agreed. So they started setting up what would they would come to call the secret annex. I'm going to tell you more about how that was designed in just a bit. But this is this little area actually in the building yeah. where their company operated. They start setting that up. And now mind you, the parents did not tell Anne. I don't know if they told Margot, but they did not think they could ask a young girl to, to keep, keep a, a secret, secret like that. So she had no idea. So while they're setting things up, Anne actually has her 13th birthday. It was on, again, June 12th. And she received something very important that day. A diary. That is exactly right. Her red and white checkered diary. And that was the day that she wrote her very first entry. Mm. It started with these words. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you as I have never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Boy. I know. The prediction. Right. So... She wrote that, having no idea that she was going to be in hiding within, well, it was about a month later, mm -hmm. less, because her parents had the plan to go into hiding on July 16th, 1942, but on July 5th, a huge, huge number of Jewish teenagers received call-up notices to report to a labor camp. Yeah. Margot was one of them. They got to get out. They had to get out. Absolutely. So they suddenly, it's the next day. Mm -hmm. Instead of July 16th, July 6th became their day. Mm -hmm. They said, we can't, we can't take suitcases. We can't be obvious. They'll, they'll get us. So they layered their clothing as much as they could put on their bodies. And they just tried to find ways to take what they could in very discreet. Yeah types of like for yeah. example and put stuff in her book bag okay okay they didn't want the whole family together because again no they didn't want to raise any red flags so meep meep geese is one of the dutch helpers who was very significant in the story i bet i bet most of us have heard of her she was in her young 20s at this time risking her life mm -hmm. 
Meep actually took Margot on her bicycle to the hiding place. Wow. And Otto and Edith took Anne, carrying what they could with their clothes layered, and they all headed over, and that's when they went into the secret annex. Did everyone else at the time know that they had run away, or did was the impression like they just disappeared, or were people supposed to say, well, they went to the country? What was the cover story of where they were? They very strategically left clues okay. and made comments. They didn't want to be obvious uh-huh. because they thought that would, again, look suspicious, uh-huh. so they did it in such a way that it seemed as though they were trying to hide it okay but it got out Mm -hmm. that they had escaped to switzerland okay none of their friends had any idea where they'd really gone okay but but they all believed they had escaped okay yeah except for those people who were in on it who actually knew Mm -hmm. who actually knew about how many people actually knew there were i believe five helpers who were in on it and they were all these office workers okay Mm -hmm. so a week later on july 13th is when the second jewish family joined them in the secret annex in the book Anne calls the the family the van dans but that that was a pseudonym they were actually the van pels the dad was herman mom was augusta and their son was peter we know peter we do know him (laughs) the families knew each other because herman actually worked for otto and so they they agreed to let them come in and join the frank family in hiding and i don't believe if i recall correctly that the franks agreed to this but the parents allowed peter to bring his cat mushy with him oh i would take scotty (laughs) And then in November, one more person joined the group, and that was an older dentist that Anne found very annoying mm. and had <laughs> to share a room with. Oh, no. Yeah. His name was Fritz Pfeffer in real life, but Anne called him Albert Dussel in the book, and this is one of the many new things I learned. Apparently, Dussel is German for idiot or dope. Oh, no, Anne. <laughs> Well, isn't that such a teenager thing to do? I just thought that speaks to It does. Her. So exactly. are we sure that it's her that changed the names or is that something that her dad did later? She did it. She did it. And okay. we're going to talk about how we knew, which okay. is another new piece of information okay, for cool. me. Cool. I know, but no, she came up with those pseudonyms. Okay. She yeah. wants to tell the truth, but she didn't want people to know who it was about. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Although there were only one, there was only one dentist that she shared a room with, but you don't know. It could be somebody <laughs> different. So we're going to talk next about the layout of the secret annex. Do you have any background about it? Do you remember that part? Mm -mm, No, I don't remember a lot about it. I watched a YouTube video to kind of refresh my memory, and I thought they were going to give me a tour, but they just showed me the outside of it. They showed how it was behind a bookcase and you went in, Mm -hmm. but no, I don't remember a lot about it. Yeah. Well, again, that Anne Frank House website, it's amazing. You can click and you can see, it gives you little trivia facts. Mm -hmm. You can, you could, they have have the layout, all of it. It said that they could hear the workers during yes. the day and they talked about how they had to stay really quiet from morning until evening when they could go take turns using the bathroom because they couldn't even use a bathroom during exactly. the day. Exactly. Exactly. Again, this is from what I gathered from that Anne Frank House website, but if I interpreted all of this correctly, the workers were all on the bottom floor. Okay, yeah. So that's so. where mm-hmm. all of the factory stuff was happening and the selling, the merchandising, like all of the business was going on down there and then the office workers were above them in the next level which would have been where Otto would work when he was able And he was the work. boss of this place? He, yes. In fact, I had to look it up. I never could definitively find this, but at one point I was like, does he own this company? Mm-hmm. But it would talk about him founding it. It talked about him running it. But it didn't say own it. I never definitively found an answer as to whether he owned it. So and it they, sounded like maybe he just ran it. And his employees think their bosses escaped to Switzerland and they're still running the company? Well, because he was Jewish, mm-hmm. he had been forced to give over the company uh, uh-huh. in name to some of these Dutch helpers helpers anyway okay. because he was not allowed. Okay. But what okay. was going on behind the scenes was even while he was in the secret annex all that time, he, he was, was making it. decisions and they were going to him asking, what should we do about this? What do you want us to do about that? Nice. He was running it, okay. but nobody knew that was yeah, happening. Yeah, they, they really did think this out then. Oh, oh goodness. It was unbelievable even the helpers all had different jobs that they were that they were kind of in charge of like meep did a lot of the supplies for example and she would come and she would bring them things and they would ask her can you get us this Mm -hmm. we need this and so one of her biggest tasks was being a a person who tried to get supplies without raising alarms because if where are you taking this stuff right why do you need so many yes why do you need so many vegetables and you're right how many ration cards are you using where did you get those Mm -hmm. yeah but back to the hideout okay 
time. They're on the bottom floor. You have the co-workers, the office workers above. And then it looks as though this is apparently something that a lot of the Dutch houses had, these kind of like tucked away hidden areas. You went upstairs and you kind of just come to this landing. It is just a very small little boxy type space where you have, you know, some books on your left. And if you look straight ahead, originally there was not this revolving bookcase. This was something that one of the helpers added for them Mm. to hide this. Okay. So this little moving bookcase got added because otherwise it was too obvious that this is an entrance and a place where people could be hiding. Interesting. So... So you just, now, after they had put that bookcase in place, you look like you just stop at this landing and you've got a bookcase in front of you, some books to your left, and you're done. Mm -hmm. But that bookcase opens and you find yourself looking at some stairs. To the left, there's a door. That door heads into where the Franks slept. And over to your right, on the right side of the stairs, was where the bathroom was. Okay. Okay. Now, originally... You had just Edith and Otto in this one room. But when Mr. Pfeffer came in, they decided they had to put him with Anne. And because it would be improper to put him with Margot, they couldn't think of any other place to put him. So they put him with the child. And Margot now had to sleep in the room with her parents. Okay. I'd have put the old man with me and I would not have put, I'm I'm sorry. That's just my modern brain going, no, I'm not putting the old man with the child. I'm, I'm putting, yeah. That's yeah, just, again, I know. That's just I, me, modern. It was, well, and, and it was very, very awkward and uncomfortable yeah. and, and annoying for Anne. There's no doubt about that. But their bedroom, basically, this was the Frank's level plus the bathroom because their door opened into the room where Anne and Fritz Pfeffer, the, the dentist, had to stay. You go up the stairs and now it's basically the Van Pels level. Right when you come up the stairs, there's just this tiny itty bitty, basically under the stair space. And that's where Peter had his bed and his tiny little area. He was the only one who had a private space somewhat. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that floor was where the Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels slept at night. But during the day, it's where everybody did cooking or eating or common area stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was their space. And then you go up more stairs and you had the attic and this is where they could store supplies. They could put their laundry out. And it was also the place later in the story when Anne and Peter start to develop a romance. That's where they could go for privacy. Mm, okay. That's the layout. And as you've already said, it was horrible how confining it was that every single work day when those workers were down below, they could not make a sound. They could flush. I wonder why flush. they didn't they flip could... and sleep while work was going on. Well, I think they did. I mean, it was so boring. She would talk about things they did, trying to do the quiet things, things that you had to do, but that you could do quietly. Sometimes it was just sit here and take a nap, put Mm -hmm. your head down Mm -hmm. because there was nothing else to do. But Mm -hmm. they tried to be productive. Yeah. 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 And so thinking about this diary then where Anne is recording everything that's happened, we've been talking about it as a diary, but it was also an historical document because she recorded not just their daily life and what was happening for them, but she was also recording events that were taking place in the country. Tree, in the world in the world mm-hmm. exactly for example there was an entry where she shared their reactions to the news of the d-day invasion mm. i mean you really do have a chronicle of what life was like for this group of jewish people who had been forced to go into hiding to escape the persecution of nazis i mean mm-hmm. it's all there mm-hmm. and she not only shared about that she talked about the challenges of the boredom she talked about the tensions between being forced to live with strangers yeah Oh my goodness, especially strangers who had nothing in common, who had, I I just can't even imagine, two years, two years. You've already brought it up. Having to share your bedroom, your tiny little bedroom with a strange person, Mm -hmm. an older man Mm -hmm. for two years. Mm -hmm. I thought this was kind of, it may sound a little amusing, but it's also pretty telling. On September 28th of 1942, after living only two months with the Van Pels, Mr. Dussel's not even there yet. His actual name is Pfeffer, Mr. Pfeffer. She wrote, I've learned one thing. You own only really get to know a person after a fight. <laughs> only then can you judge their true character. That's the truth, girl. So it was hard. But again, I think one of the things that I love so much is what we've already touched on, how deeply personal and honest it is. I mean, I don't know if you have any memories, things that have stuck with you all these years, but her love for her
her father. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had such deep respect and admiration for Otto, and mm-hmm. that just flowed out of her work. I felt so sorry for her mom because she criticized her mom. Oh, and she I don't was, remember oh, that. Oh, she was hard on her mom. Oh. She was. And then, you know, I, I felt I felt her annoyance with especially Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels and Mr. Pfeffer. Mm-hmm. I mean... Just all of it. And and then I think the thing that was so cool was watching her mature from mm-hmm. this young, they, they refer to her as a chatterbox, you know, this chatty 13-year-old to 15. 15. That's a big, that's a big 15. change. Yeah. Well, why don't we go to break? And when we come back... Let's talk about what happened to the inhabitants of the secret annex. And also, I want to share some of the new things I found out about Anne's diary. Ooh, yes. Not only did Anne love writing, but she also understood the importance of rewriting and reworking her existing material. We here at Scandalwater love learning from our subjects, and Anne reminds us of the importance of the edit. While we had a perfectly wonderful website, as our podcast has grown, we realized it could do with a bit of editing itself. And so, thanks to our webmaster, Josh Reith, we've done just that. Our site over at ScandalWaterPodcast.com has a fresh new look, just in time for spring. New photos, a more streamlined experience, and the ability to play each episode straight from the website itself. Grab a cup of tea and take a look. We think you'll like what you see. Cheers. We are back, and I wanted to share a couple of things that I found. That are new? They were new to me. If I'd heard them before, maybe they didn't register. But as I was reading, I was surprised by some of this. I hope that some of this might be new to you guys, too. Something that you may not know is that during her two years in hiding, Anne not only filled one physical diary, but several other notebooks and blank sheets of paper. She had basically a whole collection of writings. Mm. She was so prolific. And also, she didn't just write diary entries. She also wrote short stories. She started a novel. And she copied passages from books she read in her book of beautiful sentences because she was very strategically working on her writing skills. This was not just a pastime, like, I'm just going to keep a diary. This was a very smart focused girl Mm. who had desires and dreams related to writing. Mm -hmm. And then something happened that fueled it even more. I do not remember this at all, but it talked about, again, so many different sources mention this. The residents of the secret annex heard a radio broadcast on Radio Orange on March 28th of 1944. And during this radio broadcast, there was a Dutch government official who spoke about how important it would be for people to keep hold of and submit their diaries or other first person accounts telling all the experiences that they had been through during their Nazi occupation. And they said they were going to collect those after the war. she's got motivation. She writes in her diary the very next day after hearing that radio broadcast that everybody she said everybody pounced on me they were automatically like and your diary Mm -hmm. and you could tell from the way she talked about it it fueled her fire and then here's what she did I never knew this before she started rewriting her diary really for publication she went back and she started from the beginning and she started revamping what am I going to leave in what am I going to take out what am I going to add how am I going to bump this up and revise this she was writing writing a whole new version that incorporated a lot mm-hmm. of what she'd is already done. Is that when she changed the names? That's when she did ah, her pseudonyms. okay. That's when she did her pseudonyms. They literally call her first diary entries, her first set of writings, her version A. Her version B was her for publication okay. version of her own book. The entries that took the most, I don't want to use the term hits in terms of revision, but the ones that she revamped the most were the diary entries she had written during her first six months in hiding. She was really re- working those and she made a lot of changes now about those pseudonyms yes that's when she decided she was giving pseudonyms to all of the people staying with them right right. she gave them to her own family as well okay because you've you've referred to it as a diary and a book so to me her diary is the first pass and the book is the second pass well there's another interesting point let me finish the pseudonym and then i want to address that okay so her pseudonym her family pseudonym they would have been the robins in instead of the Franks. Okay. She would have been Anne Robin. Her father would have been Frederick Robin. Margo would have been Betty Robin. And Edith would have been Nora Robin. It was her dad who decided to to keep keep the Franks 
family names intact when they publish the book. We're, we'll talk a lot more about that. To your point, when she heard that radio broadcast and decided that she wanted to write it as a book, uh-huh. she immediately knew the name of it. She wanted it to be called The Secret Annex. Oh. And she knew that she literally commented, it's going to sound like a detective it novel. It does. Everybody's going to want to read it. And her book was published with the our English translation is Secret Annex but it was I think I'm gonna probably mess this up but Het Octorhus that was the title it was only in America that it was published as Anne Frank the diary of a young girl girl. okay and it is significant because think of the difference even in that title when you hear Secret Annex versus Anne Frank the diary of a young girl changes Mm -hmm. your whole slant on what you're reading and what you think the purpose of this is so Anne was writing so much remember this this whole thing and none of her family has read this correct she would share things she would okay she would she was she was proud of her writing so she would sometimes read an entry but then a lot of it was very private okay but and she again she was writing short stories and other things that she would share too but she is working on this project so hard she's adding new diary entries while she's revamping this is all happening and as she was moving into the summer of 1944 she was approaching her 15th birthday she'd been living in this secret annex for basically two full years and like these are the things on her mind it's it her life the way it's been going and her project and I felt like this led into another snippet that I wanted to share with you which is what she wrote on May 26th 1944. I've asked myself again and again whether it wouldn't have been better if we hadn't gone into hiding if we were dead now and didn't have to go through this misery especially so that the others could be spared the burden but we all shrink from this thought we still still love life. We haven't yet forgotten the voice of nature and we keep hoping, hoping for everything. Mm. That was the end of May. Anne wrote her very last entry, August 1st of 1944. Did she write in between that? Oh, yes. Okay. okay absolutely. Okay. okay. But, but this is kind that of... That was a significant just, passage and this is her uh, last yes, passage. Or she, yes, okay. absolutely. So she wrote her last entry on the 1st and it was on August 4th that Meep Gies was in her office and she heard someone enter. She looks up and she sees a man mm. pointing a gun at her. He tells her, don't make a sound, don't speak. And then there were other officers with him. It, it's actually something you know they've, they've had to recreate everything from witness testimony mm-hmm. and memories and mm-hmm. so some people said there were five to eight people there they were only able to actually they're very evidence-based they were actually able to name three of the officers so somewhere between three and eight were in on this raid but these police officers left Meep, went over to victor kugler's office he basically ran the company now that Otto was upstairs so he was kind of the next in charge basically mm-hmm. so they questioned him these are two of they're two of the help we know Meep is but the other victor is, is another helper help. mm-hmm. they took him victor with them to search the building and when they got up to that landing Mm -hmm. somehow somehow it seemed that they knew you Mm -hmm. know they they knew that there was something behind there and to this day they don't know how i heard on uh, one of the videos they there's rumors about who betrayed them Mm -hmm. like there was a i the video i saw they've narrowed it down to a certain gentleman like you tell us or we're gonna kill your family and he i I mean i don't know this is just theories well that was a book that was published where they had they put fbi agents on a they reviewed it as a cold case Mm -hmm. and that book i believe it was called betrayal came out Mm -hmm. and then the dutch people took it off the market they Mm -hmm. said that it was not founded this is this is pretty recent and i actually found a statement I think it was on the Anne Frank House website where they explained how evidence-based they have to yeah, be yeah. and how they could not support okay. the foundings of that book. Okay. And so that's actually, that was the kind of a little controversy that happened just in the last few years, I believe. Okay. So to this day, we, they, still, don't we know. still do not know. So there may not, well, clearly someone had to have told. They found out somehow. Yeah. There have been so many different theories. A lot of the theories are that somebody told, whether it was a worker who figured it out. Uh-huh who heard noises Uh there was a break-in at one point could the burglar 
have heard that because at nighttime they were moving around and they were doing things. Right, right. So there was right. the fear that a burglar could have figured it out. Somebody walking by on the streets who saw light or heard noises, you know. Uh -huh. But and then there were a lot of specific names that have been mentioned. Of, okay. Could it have been this person? Could mm -hmm. it have been that person? Absolutely. But back to this moment when mm -hmm. they were being found, Otto later said, "Quote: I was upstairs with the Van Pels family in Peter's room, helping him with his schoolwork. Suddenly, someone came running up the stairs, and then the door opened, and there was a man right in front of us with a pistol in mm. his hand. Downstairs, they were all gathered. My wife, the children, and the Van Pels family all stood there with their hands up in the air. That's the end of his quote, but then it goes on to say that Fritz Pfeffer was brought in the room right after that. And those residents, all eight of them, plus two of the helpers, Victor Kugler and Johannes Kleiman, were all arrested. Mm. And they were all taken to a police building to be interrogated. The helpers were sent to prison camps, but they did both end up surviving. Okay. Yeah. And Meep Gies was almost arrested, but she tells in different interviews that she happened to have a hometown connection to one of the officers, and he let her go. He Ooh. was sympathetic to her. She called on that connection, okay. and he let her go. I'm going to go through in a moment and tell you what happened to everybody. But first, I want to share just this brief clip from Otto Frank. He was the only survivor of the eight. And here's his... his I know, gosh. This is his telling of what happened when the family got to Auschwitz. Actually, basically, all of them, the whole group, first went to some kind of a police building for interrogation. They ended up going to an Amsterdam prison for a little bit. And then they were in a transit camp, which I believe was Westerbork for a while. So it actually took almost a month before they did that terrible, awful transport train and they went to Auschwitz. So this is Otto picking up there. Of the eight taken away, Otto Frank was the only survivor. The others were among the 100,000 Dutch Jews, three quarters of the country's Jewish population, to die at the hands of the Nazis. In an interview with CBS in 1964, Otto recounted what happened when his family was put on the cattle cars to Auschwitz a month after their capture. On September 4th, 1944, the last transport went to Auschwitz. Well, when we arrived in Auschwitz, there were men standing there with clubs. Women here, men there. We were separated right on the, at the station. So women went to Birkenau camp and we went to Auschwitz camp from the station. And I never saw my family again. That's so sad. Well, and what's even sadder is that this was a place where they were making decisions. They were selecting who was going to live and be forced to work and who was going to go straight mm -hmm. to their death. Mm -hmm. And Anne never knew that her dad passed the selection, you know, because a lot of the reports come from people who were in the concentration camps mm -hmm. with different family members. People would, you know, share to try to, mm -hmm. to give information to loved ones, you know, after they'd made this through the war. And so that was something, you know, you got different reports, different reports exactly. And so that was something that was said was she thought her dad was older and he wasn't mm -hmm. a super fit, healthy fella. So she always wondered, mm -hmm. thought actually, that he probably went to the mm -hmm. gas chambers. Gosh. Yeah, but here's here's what happened to follow up on this. All of the residents of the secret annex were actually on that transport and arrived there at Auschwitz. We've already said Otto is the one who ends up surviving. He was with Herman and Peter for a while, okay? And actually, I think Fritz was there too. So just to kind of go through them one at a time, Fritz was selected to be part of the group assigned to hard labor. It was very, very demanding. And so although the details are unclear, there weren't a lot of reports, they know that somewhere around November of 1944, he ended up being sent to a different concentration camp where he also was doing hard labor under just appalling conditions. And so a According to the camp records, Fritz died on the 20th of December 1944, and the cause of his death was listed as enterocolitis, which is a gastrointestinal infection. Poor buddy. I know. Herman Van Pels was also assigned to do hard labor at Auschwitz. They decided, I think he actually worked with Fritz, and after the war, it was fellow prisoners who reported that the guards had sent Herman to the gas chambers in October of 1944. Mm. He was 46 years 
years old. Gosh. I know. Peter, I don't know how this would have happened because he was young and, and presumably the most fit. But he was assigned to the Auschwitz post room, which was actually a much better assignment. It meant he was able to get a little extra food from time to time, which he would share with his father mm-hmm. and Otto. But then he survived, you know, for quite a while when the Nazi leadership decided they were going to evacuate Auschwitz because the Soviets were approaching. Otto was actually in the sick barracks at the time and he tried to persuade Peter, you know, you come into the sick barracks too. You pretend you're sick. Don't go on this march. But Peter felt that he had a good chance of surviving and probably thought, you know, you you had no idea what was happening. He probably thought he had better odds going with the the healthy prisoners instead of Mm -hmm. staying back but this is one of those marches that they refer to as a death march Mm. and so he did make it he did get to i'm not sure if i'm saying this correctly matt housen concentration camp but there he was forced to do hard labor he fell ill and he ended up in the sick barracks the camp was actually liberated by american troops on may 5th of 1945 but according to a list kept by the medical staff he died on may 10th he was only 18 so remember the women were sent the men and women were separated as Otto said in that little clip and so Edith was sent with her daughters and reportedly everybody said that they were so tight I saw that in the video I watched yes that all there was no tension she was Mm -hmm. so protective of them the girls were so connected to their mom she was Mm -hmm. you know they were just so tight but then they were separated at the end of October Margot and Anne were sent on to Bergen Belsen and a woman who befriended Edith when because her daughters were taken too she reported later that Edith became ill and ended up in the sick barracks and that she passed away on January January 6th of 1945, which was three weeks before the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. They were so close. I know. Now, as for Margot and Anne, according to the Anne Frank House website, it says, quote, The conditions in Bergen-Belsen were terrible. There was little food and hygiene was poor. Infectious diseases broke out. Margot and Anne became infected with spotted typhus. Rachel Van Amerongen Frankfurter, a fellow prisoner, would later recall, quote, They had those hollowed out faces, skin, and bone. You could really see both of them dying as well as others. Margot Frank, like her sister Anne, succumbed to spotted typhus in February 1945, two months before the camp was liberated by British soldiers. Anne was 15. Mm. And that actually is a change. Like, I think even in the book that I would read with my students, it said March. March. But they have since traced it back, used different evidence, all these different reports, Uh and they now believe that it was February. And then finally, Mrs. Van Pels was sent to Bergen-Belsen with Margot and Anne. And that same month they died, February, she ended up getting sent to a different camp, Ragoon. And then, after a while, on to another camp, Terrenstadt. But although these two different witnesses, um, people who had been around her, they, they gave different versions of her death. Both women agree. They both say that she died during the transport. And one of them thought that she had spotted typhus like Margot and Anne. Mm. That was something that was just rampant in the mm-hmm. camp that they had come from. So that's what happened to everyone. Um, but what happened to the diary? Well, it was common practice <laughs> when these people would raid hiding places and arrest Jews or even if it wasn't if they were just arresting Mm -hmm. Jewish people who were not in hiding Mm -hmm. either way they would often loot them Mm -hmm. and they would take their valuable property supposedly it was to help pay for costs and transportation and all that but oftentimes they would just keep it for themselves so what happened was one of the officers raiding the secret annex wanted to use Otto's briefcase to carry valuables turned it upside down and emptied it and what was emptied was Anne's writings a lot of them not everything made it not everything made it but a huge huge so it was all in his briefcase she had yes a lot of it was in his briefcase after the arrests meep and another helper named bep another woman who was young one of those office workers they went back to see what they could say for the families and meep was the one who rescued ann's writings in fact she went and put them in a desk i think it was in her office they had version a they had version b i mean there were some things missing but the thing is what was missing a lot of it they know they still had it because Anne's version b incorporated it does that make sense it does so some of the notebooks that were missing 
she'd already rewritten. So okay. they're still there. So she had all of this. It's in a desk drawer. I heard her tell about this in an interview. She and Otto remained friends. He lived with them after the war. She and her husband, he lived with them for quite some time. And she talks about being there the day. He's at the other desk. They're working together. And he gets the letter that confirms his two daughters mm. are gone. Mm -mm. And she said that she immediately went over, opened that desk drawer, took out those notebooks and the diary, and he handed it to him and said, this is the legacy of your daughter, Anne. Mm. And he couldn't read it. Mm -mm. He couldn't read it for a while. She had not read it. Really? That whole time. In mm. fact, she commented later, she said, thank goodness she didn't, because if she had, she would have been forced to burn it because she would have been afraid that somebody finding it, oh. it would have like compromised oh. the people in hiding and like, yeah. cause she didn't know what had happened to right. them. She right. had no idea what had happened right. to these people who were taken away or the helper, you know, like, well, she knew it would also endanger the helpers. So she did not read it. It survived. It took Otto a while to, to read it himself. When he did, it moved him so much. He started showing sharing little pieces of it with family members or friends and everybody kept saying you've got to publish this mm -hmm. she, that was her deepest wish mm -hmm. they said this is a human document everybody needs to read this they need to experience this so he went through quite a bit of work took time to translate it mm -hmm. and this is going back to something we touched on before he made changes to it you know what let's set that aside for a second and come back because I think that's something we're probably going to discuss in our armchair okay. but so the book was published for the first time in 1947 it was a very small printing slightly over 3,000 copies a few years later he managed to get it published in Germany and France first in small numbers Mm -hmm. But then again, over mm -hmm. time, sales start to pick up. He tries now to move it to America. Same thing, difficulty finding a publisher. But then there was an American author who'd read a French copy who really got behind it and was like, We got to publish this. Right. And he pushed for it and also said, There should be a movie and there should be a play. Mm. And in fact, it's a little sad because that particular advocate wanted to be the one to write the play. But Otto ended up going with playwrights. Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett. They are the ones who very famously wrote the play version that we all know, The Diary of Anne Frank. It took them almost two years to write it. It opened on October 5th of 1955, and before the opening performance, Otto Frank wished the cast members every success, but told them he could not see it himself mm -hmm. because he could not see his family on mm -mm. stage that way. Mm -mm. They did their final Broadway performance on June 22nd, 1957. After that, it started touring the U.S. It won several awards, and then they started staging the play in many other countries. Just to give you an example of how it was received, one of my sources said, quote, In Germany, the play made a deep impression, and more than two million people came to see it. Afterwards, there was often a minutes-long silence. I've... In Germany and in many other countries, the diary became better known because of the play. So, Goodrich and Hackett, those same playwrights, also then went on to write the screenplay for the film, The Diary of Anne Frank, which was released in 1959. It was not a blockbuster. In fact, it was a little disappointing at the box office, but it won several prizes and three Oscars for Best Actress in a Supporting Role, which went to Shelley Winters, who played Mrs. Van Dien. Okay. Best Cinematography for Black and White and Best Art Direction, Set Direction, also in Black and White. I wonder if it's something that is more powerful experienced live in theater. Mm. You know, the emotion, yeah, yes. how you feed off the emotion of the mm -hmm. people. I just wonder that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I come to think of it, I'm not sure I've ever seen it performed live. Have you? Mm -mm. Yeah. No. Well, and then we've gone on to say, we started the episode talking about how many different miniseries and, mm -hmm. and and movies and, and documentaries, all these different things have been created from her story. And just off mic, you and I were talking about mm -hmm. a small light, mm -hmm. which I just... believe our friend Liza first told us about it. It came out last year and I have not seen it yet, but it is on my list of things that I want to watch. And it comes at it from the angle of focusing on Meep mm -hmm. and her story as mm -hmm. a helper. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a different angle. It, it had great reviews. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to check that out. Armchair Psychologist. That brings us, I think, to our armchair. Okay. And so I wanted to go back to that idea. My experience with this book and the movies, because I've seen more than one of the movies, was always, Otto's always been like 
the hero in my mind. Yeah. Always been a hero. First, Anne's adoration for him mm-hmm. and the way she portrayed him. And he was just so brave and so patient and so, oh goodness, the way he held the families together. He was he was a mediator. A and true just, patriot. Yes. And then he running a business at the same mm-hmm. time. I mean, like, I have always had such a wonderful impression of him because of the way Anne viewed him and portrayed him. And then also putting her diary out there, honoring her her legacy, fulfilling mm-hmm. her dream of becoming a writer. That's always been who he was in my mind. So I was a little surprised to learn that in more recent years, there's been a little controversy over the approach Otto used when he decided to publish Anne's work. Because rather than simply take her version B, which is that, again, that that whole piece that she had rewritten, putting it together the way she wanted mm-hmm. her her book to be published, he actually decided to make changes and, and created what people refer to as the C version of her story. Okay. That was the 1947 book. They call that the C version. According to a Washington Post article, I think it was a year ago that it was written, they said the 1947 publication of the diary involved undoing aspects of Frank's editorial work and restoring parts of the original diary that the 15-year-old had removed, such as details about her brief romance with Peter Van Pels. So dad put it back in? Dad was the one who put it back in. Now, they also, different sources would make a point of saying it's probably not Otto by himself. Editors from the publishing company, Uh different people probably also had a hand in deciding what should be in that 1947 version. But apparently there were things, several things, put in that Anne had taken out. She had taken out a lot of her criticism of her mother, like some some unkind things that she had said about her mom were taken out. He put them back in, or a lot of them, not all of them, I'm sure. But then other things he decided to cut. For example, there was a really harsh criticism of Otto's marriage to Edith that he took out or he decided should not be in there and some of Anne's personal reflections on puberty and sex. Those were some things that were removed. Just to give you an example, the even the beginning of it, this was something that, that one of the sources mentioned. Her intent was to start her book with this opening, a reflection on how it, how it felt to keep a diary and the fact that she was looking towards publication. She intended it to say, quote, writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on, neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13 year old schoolgirl. oh well it doesn't matter i feel like writing and i have an even greater need to get all kinds of things off my chest that would have been her beginning okay instead the 1947 version starts with her talking about her schoolmates and you know so it's a very different beginning it's a cold opening yeah in the second version sounds yeah. like so over the years now different editions came out it, it took decades but some of the later editions that came out did add back in some of the things that had been removed mm-hmm. so like if you if you read different versions. published versions, mm-hmm. you will see some different entries, but it has been a little bit of a point of, of criticism for Otto. In fact, this Washington Post article even said the fact that it was published as a diary, well, I'm going to use their words, the published diary makes Frank more of a child victim and less of a writer with intention and purpose. Like they think in terms of her literary, she wanted to be a writer, she wanted to put out her words her work in the way that she wanted to and they felt that in editing it the way her father an adult did Mm -hmm. he kind of took away her writer's license and turned it into just here's a child who suffered through some terrible things well it sounds like he's editing it as a father yes And he's editing it as, this is my daughter. This is what she went through. And it could be a little bit of like, look what you did to her. Mm -hmm. Look what happened to her. Mm -hmm. So he's thinking, he's thinking at it from a lens of not just, I'm now her editor, but I'm also her dad. And she's not with us. She's not with me. And I want you to know what all she had to suffer. Mm -hmm. So what is the question? Like, what do we... Yeah, what are your, just in general, what are your thoughts about that? It's hard because yes, it is her words and it's how she wanted it to be, but She's also between the ages of 13 and 15. And we all need an editor. We need someone to help us Mm -hmm. shape it. Obviously, the perfect 
world would have been later that she could have worked with her dad and they could have done it together but he's he's what's left and he's not in her brain and all he can do is go I took care of her her whole life I'm gonna take care of her now I'm gonna preserve her memory the way I think is best as her father and as the adult and as a someone who is seeing not just the trees but the forest so he's seeing everything and we're coming at it it's almost like it's a blending of the two of them so mm-hmm. we've got her words through his lens mm-hmm. so I think it's almost like it's their book you know mm-hmm. they created this together for her it's posthumously gosh I don't know what do you do how do you tell somebody how to put their kids book together you know he did the best that he could mm-hmm. he did what he thought was was best for their family I'm glad he kept their names so that they would be able to live on I can't fault him I just can't I can't he he knows he knows what he took out and maybe he was protecting her and maybe he was also honoring Peter by putting in the stuff she took it out with Peter but Peter meant a lot to him too mm-hmm. and he wanted him and like maybe he would have loved to have seen them get together and this would have been my son-in-law so I'm gonna fictionalize or, or I'm gonna I'm gonna show what could have been by including this and putting this back in mm-hmm. you know I don't know what do you think I have so many thoughts right now. I don't even know where to begin. I should go ahead and just add this. You mentioned something about it being almost a collaboration. That's actually another point of controversy. At some point, people were accusing him Mm -hmm. of it being his work more than Mm -hmm. hers. And Mm -hmm. so they're actually at some point out there apparently is a version where they have version A, version B, and the published version, version C, and they've got it like a side by side so that you can see how much you changed it, it. it. Right, how much was changed, and they they have definitively proven that she is the author because that was an accusation. Like, is it even her work? It mm. sounds so mature, it's so insightful. He's the one who edited. How much oh. did he change it? So, so that's I think been definitively put to bed. I think people do now say, no, she wrote this. Oh yeah, he, I think she yeah. wrote it. He's just her editor and, and right. person that assembled mm-hmm. it. But then there was another little point of controversy. I believe this was, don't hold me to it, but I think 2015, because they were afraid the copyright was going to be expiring oh. for the original version, uh-huh. they listed in some countries, I, I, I'm can't remember which one it might just be in the Netherlands I'm not sure but they put Otto Frank as a co-author so that the copyright would last longer yes to extend the copyright so you have those things going on so I'm but I'm kind of putting those aside because the last thing I want to talk about is copyright I think everyone agrees this was her work it is a matter of how he revised or changed her work and I do agree wholeheartedly with some of the points you were making I think that part of it was the father who was trying to honor his daughter his daughter's wishes the people the other people involved the other people he loved the the time period it yeah. was 1947. Sure. What was what what would the publishing company allow you right. to publish? Right. Like what was the influence of the other editors right. who were saying, mm, "No, this part needs to go." Yeah. I did hear that there were there were constraints. Like it's too long. You're gonna have to cut stuff sure. because this book is too long, and we want it to be this length. And they don't know it's going to become the book right. that it's going to Absolutely. become. Absolutely. If you want no... this published, you have to cut it down. Right. So I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to say that he made all the decisions, and I also don't want to think about all the factors that affected him. On the flip side, had Anne lived and published her own book, she might have been making some of the same cuts. She could have. Like like with his influence or with the publisher saying to her the same things, you got to cut some, or you're not allowed to put some of this content because it's 1947, or whatever, you know, or or somebody saying to her, do you really think that you want the Van Pels to know you said this about right, them? Right, Or for Mr. Pfeffer to know that this... This is how you you called him an idiot. Right. I mean, like she might have changed things herself just because this publication in in a worldwide audience or even a even a regional audience would have maybe made her think differently. Mm -hmm. The one sticking point is it is hard to think about. She did have time to say, I want to revise this. I want to think about a book for publication. She specifically decided, I don't want to tell the story of my romance, or I don't Mm -hmm. want to include these awful things I said about my mom, Mm -hmm. and then to put those in. I know. That's the only part that it's like, well, that she was extremely intelligent, but she's 13 to 15 years old. Mm -hmm. She's still a baby. She's still a baby. Still still a baby. And maybe, maybe he was pressured like well if you want to publish it then we want to see this part again we don't know how much was auto and how much was the publishing company who did not know this book is going to go on to become Mm. what it is to say well if you want to sell copies you better include the romance 
if there's romance, people want to read about that. We yeah. just don't know. We're yeah. not in any of their heads. We don't know. I feel like he did the best that he possibly could to honor her. And and thankfully, thankfully, we're not talking about her writing this diary and going, this is private. I want this to be private forever. Nobody ever published this. And then he does it anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's different. We now know I want this to be published. We now know that she rewrote parts of it. She was already editing it. Yes, she absolutely was. So I think she'd be okay with the edits. It's just, would her 18-year-old self go, oh yeah I want to put this back in Mm because she'd already changed her mind on other things Mm -hmm. yeah we just don't know I think I ultimately land basically where where you just uh, alluded I I feel like Otto came at it with the best of intentions with love he came at it with love he wanted his daughter was gone he wanted to fulfill her dreams Mm -hmm. he wanted to tell their very personal tragic moving story Mm -hmm. And I think he did it in the best way he knew how, probably with whatever guidance he had yep. there to help him. And and it's I think it's easier to look back on something. Gosh, it's we're eighty years later. I know. You know, I mean, you can second guess a lot of things. Yeah. I think any of our decisions. <laughs> right. You look back at them later. Right. But but I I'm I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Me too. And I'm so glad that her story is out there because how many how many people world why it's a story that needs to be told absolutely literary historical personally moving it's just a beautiful beautiful story Mm -hmm. so i thought i would end with one last quote from Anne. this is one of her most famous quotes i feel like probably if you know her story at all you've probably heard this quote at some point or another especially the last part of it this was something she wrote on july 15th 1944 it's difficult in times like these ideals dreams and cherished hopes rise within us only to be crushed by grim reality it's a wonder i haven't abandoned all my ideals they seem so absurd and impractical yet i cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. So a big cheers to Anne Frank. Cheers. If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music. Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reith, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the host during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.